the mathematics of weight loss. What's the real deal with calories? I'm going to explain it so you get it once and for all. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg with Wellness for Life. And if you like to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure that you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss anything. So I saw a very interesting video. It was a very geeky and uh, illustrating video. I love that sort of stuff. It was by Ruben Meerman. It's called The Mathematics of Weight Loss. And he was asking a question and he said, when you lose weight, where does it actually go? And none of the people that he asked knew that, of course, because they hadn't read physiology. If you have read physiology, you know that fat is stored in long chains of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. And when you breathe in and you convert, you metabolize under the uh, use of oxygen, with the use of oxygen, you turn that carbon and those components into carbon dioxide and water. So basically all that fat that you're burning, you breathe it out as carbon dioxide and water. And you can't see it, so you don't know that it's happening, but that's how it works. So then he admitted to being a physicist, which he was a great one, and it was very entertaining, but he admitted to not being an expert on weight loss and not knowing much about health. But he went on to say that what worked for him was to eat less and exercise more. So his conclusion was that all you have to do to lose weight is eat less, move more, and keep breathing. So while that is good advice, biology doesn't work quite like that because physics and chemistry have a set of rules. They're very, very rigid, they're very precise, and they work in a physics lab and in a chemistry test tube. But biology is different. Biology is governed by other rules. So while biology is combination of biochemistry and physiology, the biochemistry ask, answers what happens. How do the molecules combine but physiology asks and answers why. Why does this happen? And the big reason is that we live in an environment, biology, human living beings, we interact with our environment for the purpose of survival and under the influence of hormones. So let's talk about that and let's talk about how calories really work. So let's say that the average person, just for simplicity, burns 100 calories an hour. And you burn a little more here and a little less there, but just average it out and keep it simple. What we have to know is that your body can store a certain amount of carbohydrate as glycogen, but it's very limited. For most people, it's somewhere around 1,500 calories, and that's represented by this skinny little uh, rectangle here. On the other hand, your body can store unlimited amounts of fat. So an obese person might have 500,000 calories stored as fat, and a relatively thin person like myself is still going to have about 100,000 calories stored as fat. So we have a lot of potential for fat storage, but we don't have a whole lot of room for carbohydrate storage. So what we want to understand here is that fat is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which ironically is the exact same thing that makes up carbohydrate. So these things are interchangeable. They can go from one to the other. So when the body starts storing carbohydrate and it runs out of room, it turns the rest of the carbohydrate into fat of which you have an unlimited amount of storage. So let's look at the life in the day of a carbohydrate eater. What does it look like? So let's say you filled up your carbohydrate stores before you went to bed and through the night you burned 800 calories and half of that was fat and half of that was carbohydrate. Just for simplicity. That means in the morning your carbohydrate stores have burned up 400 calories. That means they have room for 400 calories of carbohydrate. So 
you wake up at eight in the morning and you have a cup of coffee and you have a slice of toast with some jam on it and you have some milk with cereal and it doesn't really matter which cereal because they're all grain they're all carbohydrate whether you call it corn or rice or sugar or granola it's all carbohydrate so with that breakfast let's say it's 600 calories your blood sugar is going to rise very very quickly and your body doesn't like that it likes blood sugar in a very narrow range it likes to have between 80 to 120 milligrams of blood sugar floating around. That means you have about one teaspoon of blood sugar floating around at any given time. So that's all, one teaspoon. You burn a little bit, you replenish a little bit. You burn a little bit, you replenish a little bit with emphasis on a little bit. And this is not a little bit. This is a, an enormous amount. It's a threat, it's an emergency. It's toxic to the brain. Diabetics go unconscious. They get into a coma when the blood sugar gets too high. So with that kind of breakfast and you some insulin resistance, your blood sugar might get up into the two, three, four hundred range. And now, because your body, your brain wants to live, it tells the body to make a lot of insulin. What does insulin do? Insulin takes the sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cell and because you only had room for so much carbohydrate you quickly fill up the stores the excess get turns into fat and by that mechanism insulin is a fat storing hormone so it's not about how many calories you eat or how many you burn it's how do the hormones regulate it and how do the hormones regulate your behavior? Because if the food you eat triggers insulin, that makes it fat storing. That's why 100 calories of fat is not the same as 100 calories of carbohydrate because when you eat it, it influences hormones differently. Now, insulin gets really, really high because blood sugar is really high. You gotta get it out of there fast. So blood sugar starts dropping and it drops fast because there's a lot of insulin. And because it drops so quickly, it tends to overshoot. And now we have what's called reactive hypoglycemia. And when you're hypoglycemic, what happens is your brain doesn't have enough blood sugar. And now it says, I gotta have some, you get shaky, you get hungry, you get tired, you get irritable, you lose focus, you just don't function well, you just don't feel good until you can get some more blood sugar. So there's two ways your body can do that. It can release cortisol, which will start pulling from these glycogen stores again. So you have some carbohydrates stored and cortisol is released to raise blood sugar by pulling from those stores. But you can also raise blood sugar by eating sugar. That's the fastest way. So when you have a craving and there's a vending machine around the corner, your body is going to take you like a robot over to that vending machine and you buy yourself a granola bar or a Snickers bar or a honey bun or something like that. So now your blood sugar shoots up again. You make a bunch of insulin, your blood sugar drops, you get another hypoglycemia and then now we've reached noon and you're ready for lunch. So let's look at what actually happens here as far as storage. So you wake up, you have used 400 calories of carbs during the night. You can store 400. If so you ate 600 for breakfast, in between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. you have used 200 calories of fuel. The extra 400 got into the bloodstream and then they were pushed out of the bloodstream. That means that they are stored. The extra 400 is stored. So now your glycogen stores are full. And anything that you eat from this point is going to be stored as fat. So you eat another 400 which takes you through noon and now 
you had burned 200 more, but 200 has been turned into fat and they have been stored. Now you go to lunch and you eat another 800 calories. Then by 3 p.m. you have burned 300 calories in three hours, but you ate 800. They're no longer in the bloodstream. That means they got converted into fat. So now you have 500 calories in fat stores plus the 200 in fat stores. And because it was a big lunch, you make it all the way to 3 p.m. and then you have another snack, maybe a coffee and a donut, maybe another Snickers bar, and you make it all the way to dinner, and then you eat another 800, and so it goes. So at the end of the day, you might have eaten 3,000 calories, which for most people might be a little too much, but why did you eat too much? Because you triggered insulin Insulin is fat storing. In the presence of insulin, which is fat storing, you do not have complete access to that fat. You have trained your body away from using fat into depending on carbohydrate. So your body doesn't know how to get to this, and therefore every time you need more blood sugar, you get cravings and you go like a hummingbird to top off your blood sugar every couple of hours. This is the problem with eating many small meals. It's better to eat many small meals of low-carb foods, but that's not what most people do. And the best way is not to eat carbs much at all. And then what you find is you don't really need to eat many meals. You don't need to top off your blood sugar. So let's look at how that works. Let's say that you eat a very low carb diet, that you're fully fat adapted. Your body knows how to burn fat for fuel. Now, you wake up with a blood sugar of about 85. That's very, very stable. It's a sweet spot. It's an ideal blood sugar. You wake up, you have a cup of coffee with, uh, with some butter. You have some bulletproof coffee. And even though fat doesn't technically trigger insulin. It's probably a trigger just a little bit. Anything that you eat triggers just a little bit, but you might go from 85 to 90 milligrams of blood sugar. So no huge reaction, no roller coaster. Your blood sugar is level and you're just coasting along. And you don't really get hungry to lunch. Ask people who have been on a low carb diet for a while they say I can't make myself eat three meals a day it's just too much they eat when they get hungry and it's not very often so you get out to lunch and you eat a huge omelet with lots of cheese and butter and good vegetables and some beans on the side and some broccoli you eat a thousand calories but it's all low carb so your blood sugar doesn't change much it might go from 90 to 110, but it never gets to the point where you need a ton of insulin. So now your blood sugar stays stable. You burn a little, you replenish a little. You burn a little, you replenish a little. The body doesn't have to go through any convoluted mechanisms of compensation to make things work. So you coast along and you get out to about six seven o'clock and you have dinner and the same thing happens you eat low carb uh, you eat a thousand calories and your blood sugar is stable so the difference here is that you're not going to store the fat that you eat does not get stored as fat it gets used it gets burned as energy because your body likes to burn fat for energy and if you don't trigger that insulin, which is a storage hormone, you won't store it over here. It will just kind of float around in your system and be available for energy. What upsets the system is the blood sugar roller coaster, and that's why you go to storing fat and not burning fat. So in our example of carbohydrates, you ate 3,000 calories, but throughout the day, you stored 1,200 calories each day as fat. 
And as long as you keep this roller coaster going and you develop insulin resistance, you don't have full access to this fat. So it doesn't matter how many hundred thousand calories you have. You're, you're rich in terms of fuel, but you can't get to it. It's, it's in the vault. And the, the lock for the vault is called insulin. It's like a vicious guard dog. It just keeps it in there. So this is what we have to understand. It's not the calories. It is what happens to the calories depending on hormones. So while this is brilliant and it's geeky and I love it, it works in a physics lab. It doesn't work in biology because biology has additional rules on top of physics and they're called hormones. Hormones are triggered by different foods. Fat does not trigger insulin. Carbohydrates trigger insulin. That's the difference. And hormones will change behavior. They'll change the behavior of the cells. The cells will store fat in the presence of insulin. They won't store fat in the absence of insulin. And hormones will change human behavior. They'll change your focus. They'll change your hunger, they'll change your cravings, they'll change your mood, they'll change your motivation, they'll change your ability to stay on track. So it is a whole lot more to it than eat less and exercise more and keep breathing. So now what you want to do is you want to go watch that video because it's hugely entertaining, it has some good information. But keep this in mind, and if you need a refresher, then you come back and you watch this again. And you need to know this stuff well enough that you can explain it to someone else because there's a lot of people out there that need to know this. If you know 100 people, 80 of them are insulin resistant and they're heading toward a, a future of degenerative disease because of it. So share this with as many people as you can because this is life-saving stuff. And if you're new to this channel, make sure that you subscribe and hit that notification bell so we can keep this content coming your way. Thanks for watching.